Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. It has been a good time breaking down Ephesians with you all. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about this week. We're going to break down Ephesians, the rest of Ephesians 2, actually in two weeks. Uh, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 uh, needs more time. And so we're going to break it and do two messages in those verses. And today we'll be in Ephesians 2, 11 through 18. Have your Bibles ready. I have some scripture that won't be on the screen, but it will be, um, I'll be reading with you. Uh, today in the sermon. <clears throat> and if Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, shows us the power and the grace that saves us individually, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, but we're going to focus on verses 11 through 18 today, shows the power that of, of the grace of God, of Jesus, that continues to work beyond just your personal salvation experience. And now what we're going to see today is that the grace of God unites mankind in Christ. And so it doesn't stop just with your salvation. The grace of God now heals divisions and breaks down walls of hostility. And Paul is talking to the Gentile church, and he's letting them know, he's reminding them, what they have inherited in Christ, not just individual salvation, but now they've inherited the family of God, the family of God. And this message is so important in our day today, isn't it? That we are in unity with each other in the body of Christ. And I have to warn you, this scripture gets deep today. It gets deep. I did a lot of extra studying to make sure that I was okay <laughs> and I'd be ready. And so I did put a lot of the notes on our website for everyone uh, at calvarydover.org forward slash grow. So I prayed for us. Let's get right into our message. And we're going to read through the verses for today first. And then I will break down. Everyone ready? We good? All right. And you know what I've been loving about this? I, I love that we're able to take time to understand what we're reading. And one of the reasons why this is important is so that we can help other people understand what the scripture says. So again, as believers, we are also what Jesus wants us to be, a disciple maker. And so you are storing up the word to help feed other people and help them understand some of these really complicated things in scripture. And so I've been praying and just asking God to help me break these down as, as best as I can for you. So let's get into it. Uh, Ephesians 2. 11 through 18, verse 11 says, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called, and this is a derogatory term directed towards them. It says uncircumcised heathens. He was just quoting what was said about them by the Jews. Who were proud of their circumcision. Even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now, there's another but God moment here. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God. But now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united the Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Praise God for that. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him. 
and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Amen. That is a powerful scripture. And I didn't even break down the last few verses. I didn't even read and include the last three verses. We're going to save those for next week. They're so powerful. Let's start with verse 11. Don't forget. How many of us forget things sometimes? How many of us forget? How, how about this? How many of us, I forget sometimes what I ate yesterday, right? How many of us forget sometimes what God has done for us? We can get so overwhelmed by this world and we can also be so overwhelmed by how many blessings he's doing. We can forget the first ten last week. And Paul takes time to make sure he reminds them, you know, don't forget what has happened because of Christ. Don't, don't fret. Don't worry. Now you're going to see why he would remind them and give them confidence again. And by the way, their confidence is in Christ. Okay, what he did for them, not in themselves. But he's having to make sure he reminds them of what they haven't inherited too, not just the Jews. He says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. And they were proud of the circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. So circumcision was a ceremonial law in the Bible. And again, if, if you want to... Write these things down, you can, but the notes are also on our website. You can add some different notes today as I talk. Circumcision was a ceremonial law. The ceremonial laws are called hukum or chukah in Hebrew, which literally means, and I probably butchered those, by the way, because I can't speak in Hebrew. And uh, Sten Daniels can, though. Sten Daniels could do a great job for that. But this is what it means, custom of the nation. So, that was what one of the circumcision was, what it was about. Circumcision was a way to distinguish God's people from surrounding pagan nations. It was a way to say that they are different. Uh, in the New Testament, the word sanctified is to be set apart, okay, or hagios. So to be set apart from all the other nations, one of the signs was that the men would be circumcised. And that was a very a major distinguishment from everyone else around them. Now, the problem is, uh, it goes on to say here in the IBP uh, Bible background commentary, in ancient Jewish beliefs, non-Jews could never participate in the fullness of the covenant without circumcision. Although they could be saved by keeping some basic command, commandments, to be circumcised was to be grafted into the community of Israel to become part of God's covenant people. So that's what they had to do to become a Jew. So a Gentile could worship like a Jew, but they wouldn't be able to practice all of the similar things. And Paul says in Colossians 2, 11, that one of the problems was, and he says it in our scripture today, that it changed their outward uh, appearance, so to say, but it didn't change their heart. So Paul says in Col uh, Colossians 2, 11, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. So the most important work spiritually took place. The sinful nature no longer has power over you and I. And the same thing for any Jew who believes in Jesus Christ. See, here's the thing. At this time, the Jews, if they did not believe in Christ, they still needed a circumcision of their heart, of the sinful nature. Now, this could be misinterpreted a little bit, and there's some arguments in the Christian circle that the cutting away of your sinful nature means that I guess we shouldn't sin anymore then if it's been cut away. But really what it's trying to say in the Greek is the power of sin over your life has been cut away. Are we still able to keep messing up? Unfortunately, yes. Do we want to? No. And Paul goes into this thing in Romans 7, I do the things I don't want to do, I keep doing them even though I don't want to do them. So he even talks about how hard it is to fight the flesh with the Spirit's help. He's doing that. And so we talked about that last week in Galatians 5, that the Holy Spirit helps us contend with our sinful nature. But here's the reality. The sinful nature no longer has power over all who believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, so they didn't have to have a physical circumcision all they needed to do was believe in Christ and he would cut away what really needed to be gone in their life. So let's go into Ephesians 
2, verse 12. It says, in those days you were living apart from Christ. I underlined really how, how it wasn't good. How before Christ, this is what it was like for the Gentiles. And by the way, a Gentile is anyone who is not a Jew. Anyone who's not a Jew in the Bible. You were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. And you lived in this world. This is a really, this is a doom and gloom verse. Without God and without hope. Now that is the reality for the Gentiles. That doesn't sound very great, does it? Before Jesus, they were without God and they were without hope. Now he's talking to, he's talking to an unbelieving community that is now believers. So he's saying you used to be like this. Okay, but they were without God and without hope. Now, living apart from Christ, excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. They didn't have the same rights as the Jewish community did. They did not know the covenant promises by experience, like the, the Jew, Jewish community did. They got to see God work in, in marvelous ways. And then you lived without God and without hope. I can't imagine not, like, here's the thing. The Jews had God to fight for them in the Old Testament. He was always sticking up for them, leading the way and all that. They didn't know who they had. But he says, and let me go into this first, God's, now this is really important, God's choice of Israel was not favoritism. I think a lot of us think that, well, didn't God set that up? Okay, well, God's choice of Israel was not favoritism or for special honor, but for special responsibility. Now, like any human, any sinner, we can corrupt a good thing and make it bad, unfortunately. And what happened is the, the Israelites let that get to their head and they became boastful and proud, and they were not friendly to anyone who was not in their Jewish community by blood or circumcision. And so it, it, it wasn't going with, in other words, God did not want them to treat the Gentiles with contempt. But they were, because they weren't perfect. But God changes everything. But now... You have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Now this is the reality. We are children of God. This is our reality, by the way. We are not apart from Christ. We are one with him. We are citizens of God's kingdom, inheriting the same promises and blessings we have God and we have hope while we live in this world today. <laughs> Praise God. When I read this, you know what I was thinking about? It's like God wrote me into his will. I wasn't in his will before Christ. Now I'm in his will because of Christ. That is so good. Because you know what he has? He has things that are eternal, like eternal life. And his promises here on earth, his protection, his love, his grace, his spirit, the word. I get to have full access to God. I'm not restricted from him. I can, I can go to God without having to do anything to my body or to do some crazy ritual, list of rituals. By the way, the oral law back then... The, Jew, the Jewish community were adding thousands of rules and commands that God did not add. That was the problem. It was like almost impossible to live up to the standard. Really, technically, only the Pharisees were able to be as, as proper as you could possibly be because the rules were so stringent and they added so many extra rules to it. And that's why when Jesus came in, he was correcting all of their teaching. Correcting all of them. And so he's fulfilling the law, by the way, too. Jesus doesn't completely abolish it. He fulfills it in him, self. So we'll keep going because I'll explain more of that. Now, I want you to notice something. I'm going to go back. But now you're being united with Christ Jesus. 
Notice it's talking about you have brought, been brought near to, to God through the blood of Christ. Um, we must have unity with God first before it begins with other people. Why, why would that be important? Well, let's say you bring two different groups of people together. And they are friendly to each other and living in what looks like harmony with one another. But they don't know how to love each other properly. Or one issue comes up and now there's conflict. If they don't have the heart of Christ, there's not humility. There's not forgiveness. There's not love. There's not patience or forbearance. There's no self-control. You see where I'm going? The fruit of the spirit, the fruit of Christ, the character of Christ is missing from both of those people. It won't be long before that unity is divided through some outer circumstance or trial or tribulation. But if both parties have been circumcised in their hearts, the sinful nature no longer rules in them. If both parties have Christ in them, when one of them offends them, the other forgives them. This is how it practically works. I'm trying to show us how it pragmatically and practically works that we really want to see people come to Christ and be changed on the inside first so that no matter what happens, like a COVID year or an election year, there's still unity. You hear what I'm saying? Whatever may try to divide us, we know that in Christ we're still united. And so it is futile to try to bring two people together that don't have the power to stay together. And that's what Jesus does. So your unity with God is first. That is so important. It needs to start there and then it needs to go. It should automatically, when you're changed by Jesus now, you should also want to be united with everyone around you in the body of Christ specifically. Specifically in the body. This, by the way, the context of this scripture is in the body of Christ. We're going to have disagreements with the world. We're not going to see eye to eye with the world. Does that mean I'm a jerk to them? No. We show love and we show the kindness of Christ. We'll have to agree to disagree. But in the family of God, we have the wherewithal, the power to make sure we stay in unity with one another and in harmony. Why? Because we've been changed by Jesus first. So he goes on to say in verse 14 through 15, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. I want you to notice, by the way, many times in, this, in these scriptures today, it took Jesus dying to unite us. It cost Jesus his life to make sure that we live in unity together. Shouldn't it cost our selfishness to stay in unity together? If he cut away the sinful nature, which is also in the Bible, the flesh, the ways of our flesh and our sin, should we not us also put away our flesh to make sure we stay in unity together? If it cost him everything, shouldn't we do all we can at all costs? That won't be in your notes but maybe you can come back and hear that and write it down. <laughs> okay. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of the law with his commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself. This is, this is like a wow scripture verse here. One new people from the two groups. Now, just so you understand, Gentiles represent many different nations. Many different nations. The Jews represent mainly the Israelites, but there's also some other people in there that have been grafted in the Old Testament. Mainly the Gentiles is the the variety of different nations, and they represent us. But notice it says, notice what it says in there. Only the blood of Jesus has the power to unite us to God and to one another. I want to say this, and I mean it completely respectful to all of us. But our blood is not powerful enough to fix things. 
because what we're talking about is something spiritual. The hostility between mankind is from sin, and it's, host- it's hostile. We can't fix it by our blood. It's got to take the blood of Jesus. And listen, this is so important. When sin and hostility die in us because of the cross, we die with Christ at the cross, so to say. When you put your faith in Christ, you're saying, let me put to death my sinful nature. So when that dies, so should hostility. But guess what comes to life? Sin and hostility would not live through us. Love flows out towards our fellow believers because God's love overflows in us. Amen. Again, how does two people come together and stay together in unity? You could take this in marriage. You could take this as brothers or family members. You could take this as as brothers and sisters in Christ, how do we stay together if, if we don't have sin and hostility die in us? If it's still alive and active, there's going to be a problem eventually. All the superficial being nice with each other is going to die off. <laughs> and then one issue in our world shows our true colors. But the church must stay united. Because Jesus died to make that happen. So what does he mean by he broke down the wall of hostility? This is, this is, wow. I'm blown away by this. I remember studying this in college, but man, I had to re-dig in again and, and learn some things. And I just want to show you, this is uh, Herod's temple. So this is in the New Testament era, what the temple would be. This is where the Jews would worship. And there's actually a physical barrier, not just a spiritual barrier, that was between them. So here would be the court of Israel. The Israelites and especially the men were allowed to enter there. This is where you get into the most holy of holies where only the high priest can go in once a year. And the priest would do all their sacrificial uh, offerings around here. Now this is called the woman's court. It didn't mean that only women can be in there, but it meant that that that's where they had to be contained. They couldn't go any further in to the, uh, the place, the temple for worship. Okay? So out here is the outer courts, but further out, see this wall right here? That is like a lattice fence, so to say. It was this wall, this fence that was constructed to keep the Gentiles out because in this Jewish community's eyes, they were contaminated and unholy and they would pretty much make it impure and desecrate the temple area. So this is how, and it got worse. Like it, this is, in the Old Testament, we actually see that God is all good with Gentiles coming to worship. But then over time, there was this major wall being put up. But this wall was okay for a moment, but then it began to be this hostility where a sense of pride and arrogance in the Jewish community, and they treated the Gentiles with contempt. And here's another picture just to help kind of show you a little bit more in color what it would look like. And here's that fence, that wall, where they had to stop. And here's what's interesting is is outside that wall would be stones, and I can't read that. But it basically says, just know if you come in here, I'm going to say in Ryan's terms, Ryan's paraphrasing, that by you entering this area, you have sentenced yourself to death. So this is the hostility. And it's all based around, you ready for this? First, religion. And then race and ethnicity. We're talking some serious division and walls. Now, this temple wasn't destroyed until AD 70 by Nero. So physically, it was still around 70 years after Christ. But when Jesus died on the cross, while that may have been still up for many years, spiritually, there was no more walls. Spiritually, there was no more walls. 
Now you might understand why, you know, looking at this and looking at this physical wall, that's probably why Paul had to remind them that that wall may be there physically, but it's not there spiritually between us. Ooh. Come on, think about that. When we see physical things that remind us of our hostility, that's been torn down now. And so they're reminded every time they saw that. But the thing is, is Jesus demolishes that. And it wasn't until Nero did that in 8070 that it was demolished. And every nation could worship together. And the reason why is because you didn't have to go here to worship anymore. You can worship in your house. You can worship in this church. You can worship by the tree. You can worship wherever the presence of God is. Here's what happened. The Holy Spirit enters his believers, and now you're a house of praise. You're a temple of worship. Praise God. There was no physical barrier to pretty much affirm this Hostility between them, it was destroyed spiritually and then later on physically. So Paul, here's what's really interesting. This is crazy. Just to give you an idea how bad this is, Paul was actually writing Ephesians because of this issue. He was writing his letter. And I want to go to Acts, and we're going to go to Acts 21. I want to read it to you. And we'll be in verse 27. It says, The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. They grabbed him, yelling, Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defiles this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. For earlier that day, they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed Paul had taken him into the temple. So they had assumed that he had taken him in the temple. He did not. So This is around the time Paul is writing this letter of Ephesians. So this is how much hostility was between these people groups. And it goes on to say in verse 30, the whole city was rocked by these accusations and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple and immediately the gates were closed behind him as they were trying to kill him over this. Word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd when the mob saw the commander and the troops coming. They stopped beating Paul. He uh, ends up escaping because this commander, they actually had to lift him up on the soldiers' shoulders just to get him away because they were trying to kill Paul. Why? Well, first of all, he was preaching freedom in Christ and that there's no longer any restrictions and that Gentiles can now worship God freely. He was preaching that. God used him and chose him to do that. Well, when he was preaching that, that was very offensive to this Jewish community in particular. And they made up a lie that he took in Trophimus. By the way, that's a cool name, isn't it? Trophimus? Like trophy? And they accused him of doing that, but he never did. So they just wanted to get rid of Paul. This is all over over a zealous religious ritual and practice that Jesus came to destroy. This is years later, many years later after Christ died on the cross. So Paul is trying to get it through their heads that we no longer have these restrictions with the Gentiles. They can worship with us because it's worship through faith. So he's trying to explain that. Then, ending the system of the law. Did I go too far? No. Now, here's a powerful scripture. Hebrews, by the way, is a powerful book on talking about Jesus as the high priest and explaining a lot of the old sacrificial systems has been done away with because of Christ. And he says in Hebrews 10, the old system 
and this is verse 1, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sin year after year, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, Look, I have come to do your will, O God. Jesus willingly came to die to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Because the animals weren't working. It wasn't changing the heart. Verse 8, first Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. That's what Jesus accomplished. Paul was trying to teach this to them that it is no longer needed. And those, there was Messianic Jews who believed in Christ, but these are not Messianic Jews. They continued to have these rules and regulations up to worship God, and that's the contention today. That's still the issue today for many Jews who do not believe in Christ. And we pray for them. We pray that they would believe in Christ, that he has broken down that wall. They don't have to do all these things to gain favor. God already loves them through Christ. Seriously, we must pray for our our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community. They need Christ. They need him. So he says these powerful words, creating himself one new people from the two groups. So just as Each of us are a new creation in Christ. Do you know what Jesus has graced us? He creates a new community in Christ. God creates a new community in Christ. And this is what's amazing about it. Uh, We become something the world has never seen before. A community full of diversity, but united by one God, one Lord, and one spirit. Now, I love what William Barclay says. I want to read it to you. Because he keeps the uniqueness of every nation. Jesus does. He keeps the uniqueness of every nation. But we're one in Christ, and Christ unites us all. And this is what he says. The unity which Jesus achieves is not achieved by blotting out all racial characteristics. It is achieved by making all men of all nations into Christians. Or like Christ. It may well be that we have something to learn here. The tendency has always been when we send missionaries abroad to produce people who wear English clothes and speak the English language. It is not Jesus' purpose that we should turn all men into one nation, but that there should be Christian Indians and Christian Africans whose unity lies in their Christianity. The oneness in Christ is in Christ and not in any external change. Wow. Wow. Come as you are, but he's going to change you on the inside. That's what needs to be changed. Not your color, not your social status. Listen, rich people and poor people both need a heart change. That's what makes Jesus the great equalizer. We all are sinners. We are all far. That's what, that's what he's trying. He's talking to a people who were so far from God. They had no citizenship. They had not experienced any covenants. And he says, you've been brought near through Jesus Christ. (laughs) 
Jesus wasn't trying to make one ethnic nation. He was trying to make one people who are like himself. And the uniqueness and the diversity would be beautiful. That's why when we go to other countries, worship is different. When I went to Dominican Republic, worship was much different. There was some dancing in there, right? It was different, and that's beautiful. That's great. Anyway, let's keep going. So almost done. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He says that a lot, doesn't he, in these verses? He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. We actually have a Trinitarian view here once again. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. That's why I want to go back and I want to show you why I put that here. A community full of diversity but united by one God one Lord, and one Spirit. So even if we're not around each other physically, by, in, our, in the Spirit, we are one. So if you're at home right now, oh, how much we would love for you to be here right now. It is amazing to be together physically, and I can't wait to the day that we can do that more and be together. But in Spirit, we are still together, and we're one church. And I thank God for that. I do miss us all being here, though. I was reminiscing. I saw a picture from a couple months before COVID, and this place was packed with people worshiping God. I really want to see that again. Not for number's sake. That, every pastor that has no idea how large their church is anymore. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. It's for the sake of we belong together. We belong together. Jesus suffered to remove what divides us and be united in him. That makes me want to put to death anything that would hurt my fellow brother that is not of Christ. That makes me want to deny any selfish ambition that would hurt someone in the family of Christ. Because Jesus did so that we would. He gave his life. In other words, serve one another. Now, next week is really important because everything we're talking about here, all the unity is in Christ. So if something is of this world, we should not bring that into the family of God and try to like it and approve it. So it's going to get real next week, just so you know, because I, we have to make sure that we're not bringing the world into the church because we're set apart. While we're not set apart by circumcision, we're set apart by holiness and purity. So there's some takeaways. You ready? I mean, by the way, God, may God help you apply this today. If you have not felt like God loves you and you have the inheritance and all the blessings of Jesus Christ, you do. If there is conflict between you and a brother or sister in Christ, I highly encourage you to go talk to that person and make things right. And I'll need one of my communion cups. We're getting ready to take communion. They were on my table and now they're gone. They should be back there. All right. In God's family, there are no outsiders or elite. We're all included and equal in God's eyes. So there is no elite Christian. And there's no outsider Christian. We are one. That is so important for us to understand. In God's family, we do not have to compete or compare with one another because the ground is level at the cross. <laughs> Mature Christians, this is important. Let's be proactive at caring and including new believers into our fellowship. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes we've been in the family so long, in the family of God, that our eyes are blind to all the new believers who need us. In other words, I hate the word, but it's called clicks. 
The, the teens use it a lot when I was a youth pastor. It's true. We have to remember that while we're feeling good about our inheritance in Christ, other people are still a little insecure of what they have. And we can help them. So we must open up our lives and our circles to include new believers, new babes in Christ, so to say, young believers who, who need to know what it means to be in the family of God. I don't want any of us to be alone. That's why this past year has been brutal. Us being all separated away from each other is not of God. It's not of God. It's been a, it's been a, uh, a temporary, necessary thing to keep some people safe. But God wants us to be together physically and in each other's company to love each other, pray for one another, teach. Thank, thank God for Zoom and phones. But we can't give up on that. Like we got to use Zoom and we got to use our phones, right? We got to stay connected. We got to email each other. But I'm telling you, we're meant to be together, seeing eye to eye, hugging each other. And I'm praying soon that that will be a reality again. I've been so patient, but I miss being in fellowship close with people so that we can express this. We can't let this world influence us to rebuild what Jesus died to tear down. We're going to hear more about that next week. We must keep our faith in and focus on Christ. As soon as we take our eyes off Christ and we start thinking about everything the world wants us to do, that's when problems start arising. We have to be careful. This is, mm. walls of hostility between men are spiritual. So religious laws won't save, heal, or unite hearts. Only Jesus can do that. Only the love of Jesus can break through. That's what we read today. Only the love of Jesus can break through. If, if you have someone in your life that you are not in unity with, pray for the love of Jesus in you and for Jesus to move in them. Thanks, brother. Pray that there would be a breakthrough between you. I know a lot of family members who are dealing with this. Pray for a breakthrough of the love of Jesus Christ. And then lastly, we're going to celebrate communion with a new appreciation today. Because while we are one with Christ, the Bible talks about how we do it together as the body of Christ. It's meant to be done together, to wait for the brothers or sisters to arrive and take communion together. So would you prepare your cups? Because this communion has even more meaning today. Jesus died not only for me, but for you. In other words, he didn't just treat, treat me with an amazing grace. He treated you with amazing grace. And so when I take this communion, I'm reminded, I don't want to get this on my shirt, so I'm going to put this mic down real quick. When I, take, when I take communion, when I take communion, I'm thinking about how we're all one and that Jesus died for you too, not just me. And I thank God for that. I thank God that he broke down the wall of hostility between us and may we do our best. May we work and do at all costs to do whatever we have to do to keep that unity in Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the cost, the blood of Jesus Christ that washed away our sins, that fixed the hostility between us and you, but also the hostility between us and mankind. God, I pray you unite us as a church. God, may we take what you've done on the cross and appreciate it and not let this world try to divide us. May we keep our eyes and our faith in Christ, in your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for that costly blood. We take this communion today, your broken body, the bread, remembering what was broken for us so that we could be put back together you were broken for us. Your blood poured out to wash away our sins. We thank you, Lord, for that. 
We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.